Hello, everyone. Welcome, new subscribers. Thank you, subscribers, for following, sharing our videos, and supporting the channel. We appreciate you. If you're new to our channel, please hit that subscribe button right now. My name is Reverend Penelope Stewart. You can follow Chemistry on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Thank you for being here with me today. I said I was going to be dropping this video. Uh, I've talked about it. Uh, and you know I've been doing a lot of research into the indigenous cultures, the aborigines, the negroes, the copper-colored people that were already here in the Americas. The ancestors have been really, really dealing with me on this subject. You know, it's been really hard to believe. When they first told me this, I think it was, it's been a while ago, maybe two years ago, but I never did really look into the subject. I never just really looked into it because I was like that, you know, I, I just didn't believe that because like the rest of you, you know, of us, we've been taught that, you know, all dark skinned people come from Africa. You know, the documentation, what we learn in school, what has been taught, we we have been taught that, that all dark skin come from Africa. And then the possibility that this could be, this theory could be totally not true, you know, I just couldn't believe it. I was at Toltec Mounds. I've been going down there for years in that area, the England, Arkansas, Scott, Arkansas area. I've been going down there for over 15 years. I have some type of intimate connection with the land there and I never known why. So one day when I came, came to meet the ancestors, I asked them, you know, why am I connected to this land? Why do I love coming down here? Why do I feel charged and better uh, after I've come down there in contact with that land? And the ancestors, you know, just as quick as I answered the question or the thought crossed my mind, the thought entered my mind that you're from this land. And I was like, how can I be from this land? How long I've been here? And the thought came in just as quick. You've been here from the beginning of time. And I didn't understand that answer that the ancestors was giving me. Then later, my experience with the ancestors is usually when I doubt a message that they start sending information on my path that shows me otherwise. You know, the more I think I know, the more I find I don't know working with the ancestors. Because if you're following the ancestors and you're a seeker, seeker of knowledge, you are going to truly follow the knowledge, the truth. You're going to do that. And that's what I do with when I follow the ancestors. This topic today is going to be, it's going to be long. I'm not going to, I'm going to be upfront with you right there. If you are Afrocentric or a patriarch, then you're probably going to challenge a lot of this information and you probably won't like this video. That's fine. You can turn it off now. But I thought I would give you a warning because a lot of the things I'm going to be talking about, we're going to be discussing because I want you to chime in on this subject. You know, I want to get your thoughts too because this is where my research is leading me. I'm not saying that you got to accept this wholeheartedly, but it's something to really think about. When you start, when we start looking over this evidence and start looking at this documentation, because we're going to be looking at the documentation. This is the first time that I've made a video where I'm actually going, we're going in together, observing this information for ourselves and taking it all in. You know, so you're going to be looking at all this research with me. We're going to be following another excellent YouTuber. Dane Calloway is wonderful. I love his work on showing the paper genocide because that's very important. A lot of paper genocide went into effect in changing who we are. You know, we're Blacks, we're Negroes. We're African Americans, we're Afro Americans. No group of people name has changed so much, I promise you. You know, so we're gonna, uh, uh, he's very excellent at that. But the main YouTuber, 
which he's he this fella here he is he's you probably need to subscribe to him too to stay in the loop uh you don't have to take everything he says word for word but he has some excellent information and documentation i it's, it's some of it is it's unrefutable you know i'm just like wow it's so much to take in uh so much challenging information his name is kiri mio i think that's his name but i'll leave the link here and show you where his site is uh, and we're going to be going on his site too so you'll be able to see his youtube channel as well very good information but right now i wanted to talk about my own observation with spirit and really get my attention to the subject you know just following the ancestors and following the sim symbol symbolism because there was so much symbolism ancestors just kept sending so much symbolism in my mind i would look at pictures or a picture or image or across my path and the ancestors be like here it is and i'm like oh i never thought of it like that and so i'm going to share some of those thoughts with you the symbolism the walk with spirit and then we're going to jump into the documentation looking at the other work that others have did on the subject and uh, the books and things like that because i know that's going to be important for a lot of you that's walking on this path that's trying to grow a lot of your spiritual walk is based in history too because you are you're true truly on a spiritual path then your spiritual methods of healing or your spiritual practices is, is going to lead you on a journey of history on the journey of a uh, spiritual historical practices so it's like a byproduct if you ask me that's just my opinion you can take it or leave it there is no must here on this channel there's just information i just share information and i like people to think because i'm a thinker so if you're a thinker you're in the right place you know so let me jump in here and just share with you about my experience uh in the mounds and my experience with spirit my first uh experience started at in the mound you know i i was looking at something that was older than me and it was connected to my ancestors these pre-columbian civilizations and that's where i had my first experience and finding out they were over all over north america you know and to find out about the washita empire and the black indians you know all of this stuff kept running across my path chief warhorse you know my hat goes off to her dane calloway curie mio and uh many more that's out there uh and the moors too but i you know i have i have very mixed feelings about the moors i have very mixed feelings about that looking at their history and what they because we have to look at it but they helped set up the united states government which had a significant impact on the indigenous cultures here in america we have to look at that so every dark face isn't a good face i'm starting to learn that too even looking at I was looking at what his name Graham Hancock he's done some excellent research we're going to be looking at his research too because he's done some excellent research you can see the ancestors working through this man because he is a seeker of knowledge he is a seeker of truth and he couldn't believe it either it knocked his socks off when he found out just how old America is and how it is you know archaeologists totally ignore the ancient history here in America but I don't think it's being you know ignored I think it's being done on purpose and for a good reason you know and you're going to find out just how important America is on the world stage as we move on in this discussion so I got to looking at the pyramids all over all over North America 
South America, especially in Peru, because the pyramids in Peru predate some of the pyramids in Egypt. When we look at South America, I mean, we're going to be going deep with this because I, I mean, I have some real stuff to talk about. So this video is probably going to be long. It, this video is probably going to be the longest video I've ever made. But when we look at the pyramids, okay, and then I want you to look at the locations too, because when we look at the location, we follow the the matriarch culture because this culture is totally be, been ignored. When we look at the in, in, indigenous culture, we're looking at the hunter gatherers culture. We're looking at the matriarch culture. And we also see echoes of it too when we look at our calendar. When you look at the lunar calendar and you're seeing the full moon and all that being placed on there, you're looking at the essence, the history, her story of the matriarch culture. So that's important too, because it's important. It was it's important for me as a woman, an Aborigine, an indigenous woman to find myself and history you know connected with my ancestors that's been you know that's been a very important part of my journey is finding myself in my journey connecting with those ancestral mothers you know the you know this this is totally been ignored and it deserves a discussion here like I said, there's no must here. This is just my journey with the ancestors, what I've learned, what I'm unlearning, looking at the symbology and following spirit. So we're seeing here where these pyramids, you know, they're here in Africa and they're here in Peru or South America. And then we see them here in Asia. You know, what is this about? There's a connection with all of those, and I start seeing those connections, especially when I look at the uh, the book Mama Wati and uh, I forgot the name of the other book, The Sibyls. Yeah, that's the name of the book, The Sibyls. I did a book review on there, and looking at that book, but see that that sister right there, that m mother there, because I have to still give her respect. There's still a, a out of Africa theory, and maybe I got that wrong. Maybe some of her ancestors were from there, and that's why she had to go back and do something, get totally integrated into that spiritual practice. So that's what she did to really integrate herself with spirit. She went all the way back to Africa to do that. But that, like I said, that's a very good book because we're still tracking the history of women of dark-skinned women in the world and that really gave me a head start on really finding this information out being able to make the connection so I do recommend that book as well if you really want to get into what I'm really talking about and you really want to understand it go back and watch those videos and this this discussion will make so much more sense to you after you have seen those, that book review and then come here. But that out of Africa theory, you know, it's, it just, it doesn't make sense. Once I start looking at the history of America, ancient America, it did not make sense because we see dark skinned people all over the world, Fiji, Hawaii, Panama, in Asia, even back the further back they dig, and if you go there, Guatemala, Bolivia, we go to these places, we see dark skinned people already being there, indigenous to those places. So it shouldn't supply, surprise us that in America it's the same thing. It's the same thing. In fact, it's the home of indigenous culture. Once we start looking at some of this reference and stuff you're going to see that this could possibly be and i'll say possible because history i mean I'm, let me correct myself technology and research and archaeology is always changing so we're always updating our information so history and all that stuff will change and as you look at this information you'll see that if we are properly taught in this type of manner 
what we've been taught with, of history will totally change. It totally changes everything we have learned because it's out of Africa theory. It just, it doesn't hold water once we start looking at world history, looking at these artifacts, looking at these things. It doesn't make sense. So it's important to keep an open mind and be a seeker of truth when we're following this information. So I started looking at all these pyramids and ancestors, you know, I knew then that, yeah, the ancestral mothers set that up. You guys told me that. You guys told me that about the mounds and the mounds of Zumfes and that was a part of the hunter-gatherer culture and that's how the pyramids really started out as they progressed, you know. And I start looking closer at the Incans and the Mayan culture here because you hear archaeologists talk about them all the time. I mean, there, and then I just took a closer look at them and the history, looking in South America and looking at these people. And that plume serpent really jumped out at me because when I looked at the plume serpent, I thought about the Nagas. I was really starting to uncover some things about America. That's because I don't know that much about America. I've been kind of educated about the others, but America, I hadn't. It puts more of the puzzle together when I, when, because it's for me, it put more of the puzzle together when I look at, at the matriarch culture in America, because that's never been discussed. I've been taught that Africa is the motherland. That's where the first mother come from. But when we look at the Americas, it, it totally shifts the paradigm. You know, it totally shifts the paradigm. But you're gonna, we're going to discuss more about this as we move on. This is going to make sense. I don't mean to jump ahead. But I looked at the plume feather serpent. And then I looked at the Nagas. I looked at the Nagas. The feathers are very important because you see the feathers, they seem to go follow. The feathers seem to be follow. And they seem to be just as old as the snake symbolism. And you see that in the Bible too, when the Bible talks about being protected up under the feathers, under the wings. You see that in Psalms 27, go back and read that. I thought that the ancestors were just dealing with me like that. Because we know that the Bible is from those ancient mothers who prophesied about the future. And the patriarchs wrote their story around the stories in the Bible because you see them marrying these matriarch women, these spiritual women. They were very magical, very in the height of metaphysical knowledge. And these men were marrying them. Go back and look at that video, Mama Wata, and this will make more sense to you. If you're not, if you haven't read those books, go back and look at those book reviews. But I started looking at that and I was like, wow, look at that, the feather serpent. You know, then I had to go back and look at the serpent mound because the serpent mound is a great representation and an indication that those mothers were here. And you seeing this serpent in every culture. I'm gonna go into that too. Because this serpent seems to be in every a part of every culture. You can see that serpent in Asia as well. We're seeing that serpent in Asia as work as well. So that's an indication of the matriarch culture being present there. This motif really screamed out. The ancestors was really screaming out some information to me. You know, symbology, if we just look at things sometimes, like I said, a picture is worth a thousand words. And that's, this what this picture starts screaming to me. And my ancestors' mothers was just like, look, I'm standing behind him. I'm standing behind him. I'm protecting him. I'm powering him. Look at me, I'm giving him something. I am the one with the feathers. I am the one with the divinity. And if we pay attention to these motifs like this, Men don't have these feathers, it's only the women. It's only Osset, it's only the Divine Mother, all right? And 
And I had to ask myself this too. I was like, okay, so if this ancient world in America, because I had a hard time, I'm going to get into that too in a minute, but I had a hard time of finding any evidence of major art culture here in America. You know, I had a, a very hard time, but I had to keep looking at the feathers, the feathers and the symbolism to really look at the matriarch culture here. And I was like, well, why is it so hidden like this? Why is the matriarch culture so hidden like this? And why we don't have more evidence of it here in America? You know, and the ancestors, ancestors revealed to me, because this is where the ancient mother comes from, think of it like the game of chess. And it's still been practiced in European royalty. But think of it like chess. You protect the queen at all costs. She has people she allocate her power to, but you protect her at all costs. And so is she the first protectress. So a lot of, why we can't find out a lot about her too, is that she was highly protected because she is the ancient one. So a lot of information that we can't find about her too is because she was highly protected in the ancient world. The ancient mother was protected. The one who wielded the divine power. The one who was the word of God. This is the Sibyls. If you learn more about the Sibyls, you'll learn that they were the word of God. They were the word of moral authority. They gave out spiritual instructions and rituals to be passed down. They prophesied. You know, we learn more about this as we move on. So I looked at that motif and I was just like, wow. You know, it, it's worth a thousand words. So look at that, the wings, because we see the wings in here in America the feathers here in America too, and that goes on into the pre-Columbian civilization, the Carnival. We see that being present there. So this is this; these are essences or echoes of that of her history right here being passed on, and we see that in North America. And so I said, I start looking, start seeing these symbolisms in this video videos on the worst week when I start doing the research on this subject and in the research that we're going to be looking at because see my research is totally different because my perspective is totally from the matriarch perspective it's totally telling the story of the ancestral mothers and the videos that I'm watching doing the research on is from the perspective that Aborigines was already here, but I'm totally interested in finding myself the matriarch culture that's been ignored. That's my interest. So when I was seeing this, I started noticing that there were different emblems for America. I seen the emblems when we see the Moors or the men indigenous culture. When we start looking at these Moors, it, it was men in kind of in those. Then I started looking at the women, how some of the emblems had women, dark-skinned women in there. And I was like, the ancestors like, pay attention to this because this is us. This is our legacy. This is, these are our empires. We, the hunter-gatherers, were the owners of the land. And you'll see that in matriarch our culture, they wield more power of the land because of their connection with Mother Earth. And you see she has, you know, I don't know what this is around her. I don't know what this is around her. kind of look like a snake. I don't know what it is around her. But they, because they were hunting gatherers, because they were planters, they were agriculturists. They were good at working the land and, and bearing fruit and food from Mother Earth. They had this connection with her. They wield the power of the land. They owned the land. Now the men were the enforcer of the law. And and some of the Moors will tell you that too. The women woman lays down the law. The man enforces the law. She was our first mother. She came directly from the earth. 
okay? That's how the ancestors speak to me. And so when I saw this emblem, I was like, wow, and here it is with the feathers at the top, okay? The fringes at the bottom. And, 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 and this bow was originally made by the Amazon women. Look at this bow. This bow, this style of bow was made and designed by the Amazon women. That's, that's going to be interesting too as we move on because I'm going to talk about a little bit about that. Like I said, this is going to be a long video because, you know, history and spirituality is my, it's one of my passions. So I love it. And so this video is going to be kind of long. I'm sorry, you guys, but it's going to be full of helpful information and my thoughts. You can chime in on it. If you disagree about it, on it, you know, put that in the comments, you know, because I want to know your thoughts, your observations, your comments, you know, and nothing is written in stone here. These are just my observations and what I've learned looking at history and doing the research. So you see in her with that, you know, and that looks like the leopard because, you know, that Wakanda story is indigenous to the Americas. It's not indigenous to Africa. They, you know, they're working hard to put all dark skinned people in Africa. But we were already in most of the places that we were in. All right. Our mothers were everywhere. All right. They went everywhere. They were navigators. And we're going to see that too as we move on. They they were already traveling the seas and the oceans. And I'm going to show you that too as we move on in this discussion. But pay attention to that. Symbolism was just screaming out at me. Then... I've seen this many of times, and I thought this is a big deal. I was like, yeah, hooray, you know, for the French. They they sent us a statue a Liberty that was black to show that, you know, America was built on the backs of black people. You know, that's how I always saw that. I've been seeing this for a couple of years now, and I probably, you've probably been seeing it and been saying the same thing. But one day I looked at this and the ancestors said, nope. That's not what that means. That's probably what they told you what it means, but that's not what that means. And I was like, what? That's not what that means? No. That is a symbolism of black women. The ancient mother originated from America. And all indigenous people originating from here. That is what that is. And I was like, really? That's what that is. Semitic people originated from here. And I, I just couldn't believe it. I, I just couldn't believe it. I was like, I never looked at it like that. Then look at it. This was a patriarch era. This is a patriarch era that when men were ruling, why would they put a woman for symbolism for justice and liberty? Why would they use a woman for that? These are echoes of our culture, of who we are. We set up the government. Like I said, the woman lays down the law, the man enforces the law. See, I never looked at it like that. The ancestors just was dealing with me. I never looked at things from that perspective. My paradigm was shifting. And I thought I knew things, but I really didn't know. You know, I'm following spirit here. This is my journey I'm, I'm sharing with you. You know, you don't have to take this. I'm just sharing my journey with you. I, I just follow the ancestral mothers. I want to know more about that older culture. And so my mind just opens up to it. I guess, you know, a true seeker has an open mind. Nothing is factual. Everything is changing every day. Nothing stays the same. As we come into new knowledge, new information, it challenges us. And spirit certainly challenges you because you have to unlearn some things and learn new things. And that I guess that's what's been going on with me. But I looked at that and I was like, oh my gosh, I've never seen it like that. So that's something to think about. Why are they using, the question to ask here is why are they using a black woman? Why did, why did France stand over a black Statue of Liberty? Why did they do that in a patriot art era and culture? And then we have to ask ourselves, 
they still kept the woman, but they made her look more European. They made her look more white. Okay? All right? They just made her look more white. So that's a question to ask yourself. Why would they do that? You know? And that went on. And I looked at this the emblem of Africa. Again, we have another indigenous woman with the feather on top of her head. Again, we still have the feathers from from uh, from from Osset. We still have the feathers here. Okay, that's been an ancient representation too, and so has the serpent. The serpent and the feathers, the plume serpent, the winged serpent, because we see that in Asia as well, has always been a signature of the matriarch our culture. We see a woman here walking with a lion. And these is this is the very description of the Amazon women. That's how that they were described by the Greeks. They were feared. They were feared by men. And you couldn't really, you know, be a, a warrior or a soldier if you didn't defeat an Amazon queen. And that says a lot. That's letting you know she was the first protectress. And some of these women, they had these magical weapons. They had magical weapons. You seen that movie, Wonder Woman. She had magical weapons. So our ancestral mothers were in touch with those metaphysical powers, that metaphysical energy, that energy, magical energy, whatever you want to call it. They were hard to defeat. That's what that witch hunt thing was all about. They were trying to stamp that out. It was hard for men to defeat that kind of power because of our connection with Earth. They had to totally make up a, a another God. You know the story if you've seen the video. And I'm not trying to throw men under the bus here. This is not what I'm talking about. I'm just trying to find myself uh, in history and find out more about that culture it's very hard to do but the facts are out there I guess I'm showing you where you can think for yourself and see the culture being present all right so this is this is this is a symbolism of an Amazon uh, matriarch you see the line there, you see the feather in her hand, she's gathering something. Again, this was the hunter-gatherers culture. If I'm, Is this a snake on the ground? That look like a snake hand on the ground. Right there at the bottom, down there by the lion. So again, the symbolism is there if we were to look at it. Alright, and you know this is a sister. Alright, you know she's an aborigine. Look how dark she is, a copper color race. You know, again... Uh, we're nowhere used to this out of uh, Africa theory, but let's just look at this out of America theory a little bit closer too, because we found some ancient human remains here as well. All right, so let's just look at that. Let's we're, we're looking at this theory now and the matriarch our culture. Now, when we look at Queen Khalifa, the seal of Queen Khalifa again, we got these women, these Aboriginal women, uh, representing these states representing these continents you know these aborigine women are on the seal and I had a hard time finding you know I was able to look up the queen of Africa I was able to look up the queen of you know these other places but it was very hard to find it in America it, it, with the indigenous cultures because again America is an ancient America. I know they're telling you this is the new world, but this is the old world. This is where Atlantis, this is where it was considered Atlantis. Here in the Americas. Here in the Americas where it was considered as Atlantis at one time. Yes, we're going to get into, we're going to look at that too. So this is the ancient world. So I had to find the ancient name, the indigenous name for queen. And when I started looking at that, I said, what is the, the ancient name? The ancient name for queen. What would they call, what would the indigenous culture, the Incas, the Mayans, the oldest civilization here? Because the Incas and the Mayans 
when we focus on them, we focus on the most indigenous cultures in the world. But see, we don't pay attention to it. That's why they're they're always talking about that because that is the most indigenous culture in the world. And we're looking at the Olmecs and all that. These are the most indigenous cultures in the world. Okay, so when we start looking at that, we let like say because they talk about his story. We're looking at his story when he came when patriarchs came to the rise because we're going to look at the meaning of patriarch and matriarchs too i'm going to show you all of this so these are not just all of my thoughts i'm going to show you where this stuff is actually like this so when i start looking at what were they calling queens some of the queens at that time what were the indigenous culture calling their queens you know and i looked it up and when i did i came up on this lady she's tano one of our ancestral mothers, her name was Anna Koona. And the women in that time were called Cacique or Chieftain or Chiefess. But Cacique is, is more of an indigenous term. And I like what they, and notice she has this eagle on top of her head. Again, the wings, the wings, the feathers. I don't know, this looks like kind of like a snake. This could be a snake, the staff that she's holding. All of this, and you see this in ancient Egypt too. This all so this is indigenous culture, an indigenous matriarch empire. This kind of all over the world. Because when we look at Queen Califia, they said she had a fleet of ships, ships that she was going all over the world to Africa, Asia, all these places. When we look at her, her army, and we look at uh, look at history, how men came in contact with her here and Herodotus, uh, I know, it wasn't Herodotus, it was someone, I think it was the Lewis and Clark expedition described her and her culture as living as the Amazon women. And then when we're looking at some of these emblems, these women look like Amazon women, how they describe them. They were the first one to make that first style bow, hunting bow, okay? They were fear men, I mean, they had stories about these fierce stories about these women. I mean, men, you could you couldn't even call yourself a man if you couldn't defeat one of them because they were so fierce. They were almost undefeatable because of these magical weapons they had as well. Look at the, the story Wonder Woman, but picture that as being, you know, there were other complexions in the Amazon women's empire but for the most part the indigenous women ran those empires because they were in connection with the ancient mothers again hunter-gatherer cultures the one who started these civilizations they started mathematics look at our lunar calendar you still see that on our calendar it's still showing you the full moon the quarter moon and all that that is the echo of the most matriarch culture of the matriarch culture because we still the farmers still go by a lunar or a map the moon controls the water the irrigation you know yeah the sun helps it grow but if it wasn't for the water and the moon being able to know when to plant certain seed we wouldn't have the nur the nutrients that we need from mother earth and these women figured all of that out remember we talked about that in the first uh Mama Wata video, she is the first mother. She is the cre first creatress, the protected, tr protectress. She is the mother of all humans. She birth, give birth without a man. All right, she was the first human. That's what that story with Jesus and Mary is about. I said in Horace that you know that's what that story is about. And we're looking at this story. This is when we first see her magical power because she put her mate back together again. Remember, she's the one that wields the spiritual, metaphysical power. She puts him back together again. So you know, the ancestors. So many things jump out at me when I'm reading this stuff. You know, my mind just worked different. I've read those stories so many times but I didn't see where the ancestors mother's story was fitting into that and now that I'm really looking at it I see the story I see the symbolism and so it really makes you think you know that's why I thought this video was very important because it makes you think about things you know and I and it's really important that we honor them by you know looking at this information just looking at it 
And so we see her Queen Khalifa here, and we knew that she was a fierce warrior. They said she had magical beasts, such as griffin like griffins, that would help her in uh, some of the wars that she fought in. So looking at her history is, is wow. You really see, see the power of that matriarch empire. All right. And, and that's one of the main ones I could look at about the Americas. And I didn't know anything about this Anna Kanaona until I look, ran up on this word cacique. And when I word, ran up on this word cacique, that's when I was like, wow, that's it. And so I started looking up chieftains. I started looking at chief deaths. And that's when I can see more about the indigenous cultures around the world, not just here in America, but I was looking at other islands too, where this term cacique was used with these other aborigines as well. You see how the connection, I'm finding more connections with this. More and more connections. Let me make sure, I wanna make sure that I've covered all my thoughts here before we moved on, move on. We talked about the connection with the serpent, the feathers, the nagas, the pyramids, uh, the symbolisms, the emblems, cacique. So I think now we can move on to the documents, the documentary. We can move on more down to the documents and my research and the references that you guys desire. So you guys are going to follow me. You're going to be with me on the screen as we look at some of this information and look at some of the information I've already covered on my thoughts. So just relax. If you need to take a break, you can stop right now and take a break before we go into the document documentary portion of this uh, discussion. Leave your comments, you know, your observations, your thoughts and stuff on this video because I want to hear, you know, I want to hear what you think and what you found in your research. All right. Hello everyone. Thank you for coming back to the second portion of this video. Like I said, this probably is going to be the longest video I've ever done because I'm covering a lot of information. Right now we're going to review uh, some stuff from Kerry Mio. He's a YouTuber that documents a lot of evidence that the uh, ancient America was the original Egypt. And Egypt wasn't called Egypt, it was called Tamari. Uh, Egypt is a Greek name and it was named by the Greeks who invaded Egypt. Egypt was first known as Kemet and associated with the name Tamari, all right, which is here in ancient. America. And so we're going to talk a little bit about the name America, where it comes from, uh, the word to marry. We're going to talk about the first indigenous people possibly being from here. We're going to cover a lot of information. And then we'll probably go back and discuss, you know, what I was talking about in the beginning with matriarch, patriarch, uh, the, those cultures, uh, Queen Califia. We're going to talk about that stuff, the Amazon. We're going to talk about the Amazon too, you know. We're going to talk about several things in this video. So this video may be very long. So make sure you get comfortable, get you some snacks, whatever you need right now as we begin this video. Uh, and I'm going to be skipping. We're not going to watch his entire videos. We're just going to be skipping uh, to vital info. I thought that was vital information in my research. So I'm going to be showing you what I was discussing and what I was looking at as well. So in this video is called the true origin of the name America, America, Ameru, land of the plume serpent, Holy Cross. Uh, this guy has some really good information. We're going to the 25 minute uh, mark in here because I want you to know the name of this book as well. So we're going to go over this book that he is reviewing because there's some helpful information in here about uh, America and the name, okay? So we're going to watch maybe about five or six minutes of this video. 
Yeah, and then we're going to go on to uh, part three of his discussion on this topic. Okay, so let's begin. 1888 by Thomas St. Briss in the office of the Librarian of Congress at Washington, right of translation reserved. All right. And we're in the introduction and it says, the object of this abridged popular edition is to present in a brief, clear and simple style our discovery of the origin of the name of America, which came as unexpectedly as that of Columbus, while we were collecting from the old works of the Spanish historians. So while they were doing research in the real uh, Spanish uh, records, they were able to determine what was the origin of the name of America, right? The customs and histories of the Americans called Indians, all right? We're just talking about the cover color races, Americans, right? Remember, couple color tribes of America, Aborigines, which they called Indians by mistake in order to show their connection with Egypt. Whoa. So the aboriginals of America and their connection with Egypt, all right? Where's the true ancient Egypt, all right? We're gonna see the real name of ancient Egypt, what that name was, Tameri, uh, Tameri, Tamir, all right? Of which a preliminary sketch was published in 1882, the connection, all right? We have attached a map to be kept in view while reading so that a perfect idea may be obtained of the places named by Columbus and of the geography of the age when America was discovered. Asia is placed in the position given to it by the first standard map of the world on which the Western Hemisphere appeared and the Atlantic coast representing the early discoveries and settlements on this continent is taken from the first atlas where the name of America is applied to its southern division to which we have added the information obtained from a local chart showing the coast of Maraca the coast of Amaraca, Amaraca, America, Amaraca, and the kingdom of Kunding, Amaraca, the kingdom of Kunding, Amaraca. You hear all this? All right. University of Toronto. All right. The coast of Amaraca. All right. It was already here, this name, Amaraca. While the cities on the Pacific coast represent the extent of the kingdom of Amaraca, America, Amaraca at the period of its conquest by Spain. Instead of referring to the numbers, numerous Spanish authors which we have consulted in order to show the importance of this empire. So they went through this research and they're not just referencing one person. They're telling you straight up right now, right? That they went through numerous Spanish authors which have consulted in order to show the importance of this empire, the kingdom of Amarca, all right? The kingdom of the Amara, Amaru, Amarakans, Amarukans, the kingdom of the Amarukans, all right? Which only bears indirectly on our subject. Okay, so you heard that there. We're gonna go on. Uh, I think that's all I wanted to discuss. Let me see what this is saying, hold on before we move on because like his stuff his stuff is so juicy so you'll have to come back and watch some of this uh yourself because his stuff is so good it's it's packed with so much helpful information so some of this stuff you'll have to come back to and watch some of these uh the entire video because some of his stuff is just oh my gosh it's packed with so There's much a pervasive uh, myth good, out there helpful that information is a, you know good strategy for weight loss or for health atlas where the name of America is applied to its southern division, to which we have added uh, Africans, really. It doesn't compare, it says, it's almost as nothing. 76 of this book, and it says here, um, Humboldt says, it is distressing to think that even at this day, there exists European colonists in the West Indies, in the West Indies, who mark their slaves with a hot iron to know them again if they escape. All right, weren't we just reading about this? All okay, right. let's stop right here. Again, we see this woman. This is a sign of an Amazon. Okay, she looks to be up here by herself. All right? Another Amazon woman. All right? I didn't want to miss that. I didn't want you to miss that because these images too start jumping out at me. 
once I start trying to find uh, the ancestral mothers in here in that indigenous culture. Okay. Charles V marking his slaves with the heart, the Indians, right? The Indians with a hot iron. So who are we talking about still here in the 1700s? All right. This is the treatment bestowed on those who save other men, the labor of sowing, tilling, and reaping. All right. So let's see this little cross here. Let's go to that little footnote in the bottom real quick. All right. It says, see the little cross? All right. It says, La Brugere, Caracteres. All right. Chapters uh, 11, eight something, I guess this is from a book, page 300. It says, I will here cite a passage strongly characteristic of Le Bruyere's benevolent feeling for his fellow creatures. It says, so he's quoting this guy, La Bruyere, from 1765. It says, we find under the torrid zone certain wild animals, male and female, scattered through the country, black, livid, and all over scorched by the sun, bent to the earth which they dig and turn up with invisible perseverance. They have something like an articulate utterance, and when they stand up on their feet, they exhibit a human face. And in fact, these creatures are men. All right, so you hear what this racist uh, French, I guess he's French, dude, is, 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 is how he's describing the indigenous aboriginals of South America and West Indies. Remember, he's telling, he's talking about how they marked. Um, you know, put hot irons on these people and he's explaining why because and he's showing you why this dude is a racist he doesn't care, he sees them like animals he's giving you an example of what he said and I hope you um, saw what he said about how they look alright, he said they're what? black, livid and all over scorched by the sun he's talking about American Indians, so called Negro right, we're not talking about Africans in anywhere here alright, so let's go back up Real quick, all right, and continue where we were. Now it says, in 1800, the number of slaves did not exceed 6,000 in the two provinces of Cumana and Barcelona. We're talking about Indians. When at the same period, the whole population was estimated at 110,000 inhabitants. The trade in African slaves, which the laws of the Spanish have never favored, is almost as nothing. All right, listen to this as nothing on these coasts where the trade in American slaves was carried on in the 16th century with desolating activity, all right? Let me put that in a different words. He's telling you the trade in African slaves, right? Which the laws of the Spaniards have never favored. They didn't really care to or, or really like to go grab uh, Africans, really. It doesn't compare, it says. It's almost as nothing. That's what happened on and see it, they, they didn't grab Africans because those Aborigines there because they didn't know this land so how can you farm a land and, and be good in agriculture in this land if you're not from here so it made more sense to enslave the Aborigines that were already here in the Americas than to go out and grab an African now they didn't start getting Africans in here until much later and they only got a small percentage to come in in here in the, in the first place because they had slaughtered all the dignitaries uh the noblemen and all the men so they needed to make you know breed more slaves so they got a small amount of africans to come in here and to help them start breeding more slaves and they thought that was going to change to our ethnicity our nationality but, you know, Africans are Aborigines too, so, you know, you couldn't ruin that. That's why I say that DNA test, it doesn't really hold up because you're not, you, you're not testing uh, the indigenous people of that time. So how can your stuff be accurate? And then we went through a matriarch, a matronial um, transition too. So, you know, that test is not going to be accurate. You're going to have to look at birth certificates and go back and look at records because they're basing it out, out of the people of today. They're not basing it off the people of the ancient day. You know, so that's important too. These coasts, on, there's nothing on these coasts where the trade in American slaves, we are talking about indigenous people, was carried on in the 16th century. What, 1500s? Way before the so-called slave trade, right? which desolating activity, with desolating activity. Continue says, Makarapang, 
anciently called Amarakapana. What? Makarapan, which was anciently called Amarakapana. It wasn't named by the Europeans or Spaniards. All right, this place, which we know as Mara Makarapan, was anciently called Amaraka, Amaraka, Amarakan, Amaraka, America, Amarakapana. You understand? Amarakapana. Again, Makarapan, anciently called Amarakapana. Kumana, Araya, and particularly New Cadiz. All right, so Makarapan, which was also known as Amarakapana, or Kumana, if you see all these in the maps, Araya, these are the same place, all right, or New Cadiz. So it's built on the inlet of Kubagba might then be considered as commercial establishments for facilitating the slave trade. What slave trade? The Indian slave trade. Girolamo Benzoni of Milan, who at the age of 22 visited Terra Firme, or South America, right, took part in some expeditions in 1542 to the coast of Bordones, Cariaco, and Paraya to carry off the unfortunate natives, all right, natives. All right, so now we're uh, coming into this book. Uh, presented, it says here, uh, to the University of Toronto Library, all right, by the Ontario Legislative Library. And the book is called Discovery of the Origin of the Name of America by Thomas de St. Briss, entered according to the Act of Congress in the year of 1888 by Thomas St. Briss in the office of the Librarian of Congress at Washington, right of translation reserved, all right? And we're in the introduction and it says, the object of this abridged popular edition is to present in a brief, clear and simple style, our discovery of the origin of the name of America, which came as unexpectedly as that of Columbus, while we were collecting from the old works of the Spanish historians. So while they were doing research in the real uh, Spanish uh, records, they were able to determine what was the origin of the name of America, right? The customs and histories of the Americans called Indians, all right? We're just talking about the copper colored races, Americans, right? Remember, copper colored tribes of America, Aborigines, which they called Indians by mistake in order to show their connection with Egypt. Whoa. So the Aboriginals of America and their connection with Egypt, all right? Where's the true ancient Egypt, all right? We're going to see the real name of ancient Egypt, what that name was, Tameri, uh, Tameri, Tamir, all right? Of which a preliminary sketch was published in 1882, the connection, all right? We have attached a map to be kept in view while reading so that a perfect idea may be obtained of the places named by Columbus and of the geography of the age when America was discovered. Asia is placed in the position given to it by the first standard map of the world on which the Western Hemisphere appeared and the Atlantic coast representing the early discoveries and settlements on this continent is taken from the first atlas where the name of America is applied to its southern division to which we have added the information obtained from a local chart showing the coast of Amaraca, the coast of Amaraca, Amaraca, America, Amaraca and the kingdom of Kunding, Amaraka. The kingdom of Kunding, Amaraka. You hear all this? All right. University of. Okay, I want to stop right there, and I wanted to really go back and and show you too about the Moors. Uh, that was was invading America. I wanted to show you that. Let me see. I see some more symbology. Okay, I wanted to show you about these Moors, why I said that about the Moors, because they were enslaving, they were coming in enslaving. Now, listen to this. We tend to think that our spirit is in our body. That's actually not correct. Your body is in your spirit. All right. Now, all that country around the Gulf of Paria and other places are no longer inhabited by Spaniards. Finally, out of the two million of original inhabitants of Hispaniola, 
through the number of suicides and other deaths occasioned by the oppressive labor and cruelties imposed by the Spaniards, there are not a hundred and fifty now to be found, and this has been their way of making Christians out of them. What befell these poor islanders has happened also to all the other others around, Cuba, Jamaica, Puerto Rico, and other places. And although an almost infinite number of the inhabitants of the mainland have been brought to these islands as slaves, they have nearly all since died. And it says, the initial letter of the Emperor Charles V. All right, so who was saying why this? Charles? Who was describing this? Charles V. And what were they putting on their, in their uh, face and in their arms? With a hard iron, a mark of C for Charles V. C for Charles V. All right. Charles the fifth. You- that's why I say every more. That's why I say these moors. This is a moor right here. Okay. This is a moor. You seeing it? You seeing it right here yourself? He was enslaving the indigenous population here in America, and that's why I say that about the moors. But it's other information too, showing them, um, you know, helping, helping colonize America and helping. Uh, the, you know, these Europeans set up the government there, all right? So the, every brown face is not a good face. That's why I said that, all right? He had slaves himself. He had Indian slaves. He had slaves from America, okay? Let's be let's be clear on that. Okay, I want to go on to this next video. I just had to show you that. Uh, excuse me. I want to go to part three on his discussion on America. And I think we're going to go to the, what minute is that? We're going to go to the five minute mark on this video. Again, this is Kira Mio. You can subscribe to his channel. So now we're in this website. It's from the museum. It says list of hieroglyphic characters, Coptic and Semitic alphabets, etc. By Sir E. A. Wallace Budge. Uh, it says M. A. and L. I. T. T. D. Cambridge, Massachusetts. All right. And it says some sometimes scholar of Christ College, Cambridge. All right. And it says he was the keeper of the Egyptian and Assyrian antiquities, British Museum. So very important guy, scholar. This is volume two. We're going to go into volume one and two. All right. This is around 1920. All right. All right. So we're on page 815 in this uh, book in volume two. And we find here the word Tamerau. Tamerau. Tameri. Tamerau. What does it say? People of the land of the Nile flood. I'm talking about the Mississippi, Colorado River, Grand Canyon. What are we talking about here? That's the real facts. All right. So dodge the hijack when you're thinking about Nile River today. So Tameru the people of the land of the Nile flood. Example, the Egyptians, a Tamaru is an Egyptian of the Nile flood of the Mississippi. Tamaru. All right, now look at this. Remove the T, right? And remove the A in the bottom. What are you left with? You left with Ameru, Amaru, Ameru, Tupac Amaru, Amaru, the plum serpent. Remember, Tameru, Amera, Tameri. All right pyramid on the Nile in Northeast Africa it doesn't have stair steps going up it. It doesn't have temples on top of its summits. They could not go and break through the boat on the temples atop those great pyramids. There are none there. And that was the clue that Egypt was writing about the Americas. And the deeper I got into the records, the clearer it got. They started actually saying and because Amun loved that land so much, he said it's his beloved land. And that word was Mary, the beloved. Mary, M-E-R-I, Mary. And the land, of course, as before, is Ta. So you have the land, the, the beloved land, Ta Mary. And they kept that name and just put the Ta on the end of it. So Ta Mary became a Mary Ta, we simply say, a Mary Ka. 
we kept the name that Egypt gave to the Americans. So that was the big mystery behind that $10 million map that Martin Waltzmuller made and then put the name America on it in 1507. And then those who knew and those who were trying to hide things said, wait a minute, you can't put that name on here. And the next time he reprinted that map, it was off. It was gone. Because that's the name that Egypt had given the land. So for a long Okay, so you heard that there. Uh, we're going to go to another part in this video to the 21 minute mark. Um, Long time we've had this idea to do a photo shoot inspired by one of our favorite movies. Lucky for us, Intel and their powerful eight. Mary. And we're back at this website called Rasta Life Wire. We've read from this before. Uh, this website, this brother got good blogs, and it says the Black African Chemites, Black Ancient Egyptians. Hmm. It says Black is ancient Kemet, Egypt. Several so called distinguished authors have proposed the Egyptians called their country Kemet or Kemet, which means black after the color of the soil. This twisted lie is not supported by any analysis. They actually refer to themselves simply as mankind or Remeth. Another name for Egypt was Tameri. Tameri, meaning the beloved land. Tamerica. Ancient Egyptian Agriculture and the Origins of Horticulture by Jules Janik, Department of Horticulture and Landscape Architecture, Purdue University. All right. And it says here, the ancient names for Egypt underscore the relation between the land, the people, and its agriculture. Katab. These include Tameri, again, Tameri, the beloved land cultivated by the Ho, Ta'ak, the land of flood and fertile soil, Kemet, the black soil, Tamhi, the land of the flax plant, and Nehet, the land of the site sycamore fig tree, and Mizer, or Mizerim, the safe and civilized country. All right, so again, this includes Tamari, the beloved land of fertile land, America, the terrestrial paradise, beloved Tamarica. All right, so we're reading this other book. It says Patapsco, a novel of Benjamin Banneker by E. Landon Hopgood. All right, and it says here, the time came when King Auzar was murdered by his brother Set, the Almighty gave Auset a son to slay Set. After avenging his father, the son of Auset, named Heru, ruled Tameri. He ruled where or, or what? Tamerica. He ruled Heru, Peru, Heru, Peru, ruled Tamerica, Ameri, Amaru, along with his mother in peace. And see, along with his mother in peace, along with his mother in peace. So I, I wanted to emphasize that there, okay? Uh, let's go on to the next video, which is part, this was part three. We're gonna go on to part five of this, this same discussion. Like I said, you can come back and watch these videos if you want to the entire video. I'm just going over certain little highlights. Uh, in this video, uh, too, uh, it's interesting. If you're interested in more, knowing more about Graham Hancock, he give, he talks a little bit about his book in this video in part five. We're going to... Well, we've already established, you know, that at least... We're going to, in part five, let's see which, where we're we going to, the 37-minute mark. In this video, let's go here because it's some image. Okay, I can't even tell if this is a man or a woman, but look, look how dark these people are. These are the Incas, you know. And again, these Incas and Mayans, this is what they are calling them. We have this outside civilization calling these people Incas and Mayans, but they I don't think they call themselves that. This is what these archaeologists and people are calling them, but I don't think they call themselves that. Okay? Trying to see if I see any more, because there's a lot of symbolism in here that I saw. I saw a lot of symbolism in here. Uh, and you can go back and watch these videos on your own. That's the interview with, uh, with Graham Hancock right there. 
but let's stop here. We're going to go right here. See, from an even earlier civilization. So we've read in these last two books that, you know, we can see that America slash Atlantis, right, had a colony established in the other side, in Africa, in, uh, in Egypt, modern day Egypt today. And that's actually was built by Atlanteans or Americans, right? Because when we're talking about prehistory, we're talking about America, right? As the Masons teach each other. So this book correlates with that. I wanted to show you this book. It's called uh, Civilization and the Ancient Egyptians by Katanga a Bongo, which I believe is an African, but I could be mistaken. Right, because when we're talking about prehistory, we're talking about America, right? As the Masons teach each other. So, this book correlates with that. I wanted to show you this book. It's called uh, Civilization and the Ancient Egyptians by Katanga a Bongo, which I believe is an African, but I could be mistaken. So, it says in this book the idea that it was Europeans who introduced civilization to Africa is one of the biggest historical myths. In fact, evidence from archaeology, oral history, traditional languages, and cultural practices strongly indicate that it was the South American Indians. Again, <laughs> the South American Indians who introduced civilization to Africa. Who introduced civilization to Africa? According to this researcher, South American Indians, some 7,000 years ago, long before the Greek and Roman civilizations emerged, the South American Indians had introduced civilization to Africa, thereby making Africa the second continent in the world to become civilized. Spurred on by their South American Indian guests, the Africans built great empires that lasted for several thousand years at a time. Contrary to popular myth, in the Western world, the advent of Europeans destroyed civilization in Africa rather than made it. All right, so as you can see, this researcher is stating what we're cor correlating about the origins of civilization and where it began. From the scholarly journal, the Foreign Quarterly Review. Okay, so you heard that there, you know. Uh, America started these civilizations. We are the oldest civilization here. There were already indigenous people already here. This out of Africa theory just doesn't hold water. Once we start looking at all the aborigines on these different continents and islands. So you see all of that for yourself. Uh, let's go to what part in this video? 53 the 53rd, 53rd minute, 53 minutes in this video. We'll go there. We're going to see. And like I said, I'm only skipping, I'm skipping over certain ones, you know. Let's start right here at the 51.55 mark. because of 19th century political and scientific agendas. When following the course of the constellations, those immovably and perpetually fastened upon America are reached, it will appear that while all that is sublime in the historic past centers upon Egypt, all that is sublime in the prehistoric past centers upon America, Atlantis, and as the curtain which has Herto concealed in prehistoric connection between the peoples of ancient Egypt and of America is lifted, it will be seen that the people of the eagle on the Nile being descended from the original people of the eagle on this continent. The twain are one in that prehistoric America was the original Egypt or eagle land prior to the mighty dispensation in the days of Peleg when the earth was divided and the great globe itself was nearly rent asunder. Again, that prehistoric America was the original Egypt, all right? The original Egypt was here in America, all right? And um, as I said right there, right before, it says that all that is sublime in historic past centers upon Egypt, right, of what they think of Egypt as today, but all that is sublime in the prehistoric past centers upon America or Atlantis, all right, the old original Egypt. 
the brief and cursory sketch, which we have thus given for the Okay, so you heard that there. Uh, we're going to go on to this next video, uh, part six. And then we're going to talk about my little discussion. And we're going to look into matriarch and patriarch and Amazon and all that good stuff. So you can really understand about my discussion when I began uh, this video. So I'm going to um, articulate and kind of talk about my discussion uh, at the beginning of this video when I talked about some things. Uh, we're going to go to six and we're going to the six minute mark in the video. That's where we're going first. The law of the world, they could measure the earth accurately. They had precise astronomy. Um, they could create beautiful maps that were this accurate. This is Graham in Hancock terms of right here. And that kind uh, so of, you can go back and watch some of his videos as well. I think, I think that's what was, that's what was sitting there. Now you need a historical uh, chronicles um, and information, right, that existed that never was taught to us, all right? So this is one of those, all right? So let's see what they have to say uh, in this article, all right? Because we are talking about, you know, a lot of Egyptian resemblances here in America. And the uh, truth is that this is the source, this is their origins, and that's why there is some resemblances here to um, all the old world civilizations, you know? We have all that here, all right? It's not just like we're similar to Egyptians or we're similar to to you know the hindu or all that it's everything because this is the source so from here it's spread out to the rest of the world all right so let's see what they say right here all right so i'm just gonna belly flop to this part of the article and it says after correlating all data that have been made public to the present time all right the conclusion is unavoidable that the oldest civilization was in the Yucatan and Central America. All right, again, the Kansas City Journal in 1896 wrote this. They're telling you that if you really do the research and you start compiling all this information, all this evidence, it's unavoidable, all right, that the oldest civilization was in the Yucatan and Central America. Future discoveries may change this conclusion. It seems that Egypt was first peopled by immigrants from the Yucatan say what it seems that egypt was first peopled by the immigrants from yucatan space will allow only a few facts that clearly indicate the truth of this assertion first the pyramids of yucatan are some of them much larger than any found in egypt all right much larger than any found in egypt that of Cheops not accepted all right and giza second the pyramids of Egypt bear structural evidence of having been modeled on those of Yucatan, notably of the one at Coloma, which covers 23 acres. Third, the early Egyptians and the Mayas of Yucatan had the same system of reckoning time, but the Mayas developed a system that was far superior. Again, we got that in the foreign quarterly review, right? Far superior or excelled, and which antedates that of Egypt is older than Egypt. All right. Fourth, the Mayas manufactured cement that was of the same material as that of ancient Egypt. Fifth, the architecture of Yucatan is of the same general type as that of an ancient Egypt, but it is finer and seems to have been the model that the Egyptians attempted to imitate. They attempted to imitate our models from here, America. Sixth, the art of both countries as displayed in their ceramics and architecture is of the same type or school that of Yucatan being much more highly developed all right again this was an article written in the Kansas City Journal Monday October 12 1896 if you want to look it up prehistoric man they're telling you straight up in this article back in 1896 that we were the source we were the cradle of civilization and we went and colonized egypt over there just like Thoth told us in atlantis uh, the emerald tablets right in the green emerald tablets right he told us he went over there right to the sons of chem all right we got the masonic book on the last video right what did it tell us that this is the original egypt and when we're talking about prehistory we're talking about america that's the masons that's one of their most sacred books ancient mystic order all right okay so you heard that there 
Um, we're going to go on to the 53rd minute, the 53 minute mark in this video. And then I'm going to go into the discussion again about what I was talking about at the beginning of this video. The most renowned geologists tell us that America is the first land, it's the true old world. All right, and what is Augustus telling us? Right, that all the leading geologists now agree, not just one, all the leading geologists now agree in the opinion that America is the oldest known continent on the face of the planet, that the fossil remains of human beings found in various parts of it, far distant from each other prove that man lived there in times immemorial and that we have have and that we have not the slightest ray of light to illumine the darkness that surrounds the origin of those primeval men all right we got in the past videos right how they're finding human bones in these deep layers right they're supposed to be millions of years old right all right so at this time all geologists knew this was the real old this continent the oldest known continent on the face of the planet, plain. Furthermore, it is now admitted by the generality of scientists that man, far from descending from a single pair located in a particular portion of Earth's surface, has appeared on every part of it where the biological conditions have been propitious to his development and maintenance. All right, he's telling you not just in Africa, no out of Africa theories here. Again, he told you in the beginning of this book, this ain't about theory. And that the production of the various species with their distinct, well-marked anatomical and intellectual characteristics was due to the difference of those biological conditions and to the general forces calling forth animal life prevalent in the places where each particular species has appeared and whose distinctive marks were adapted to its peculiar environment all right we've been talking about this in these lives we go on and in the back chats you know how could you know the animal kingdom and the plant kingdom have diverse you know different family species all over the world they're not all the same so it'll be the same for humans like he's saying this is what he's trying to tell you is the same all right humans did not just come out of one place all right the maya sages doubtless has reached similar conclusions since they call their country Mayak that is the land first emerged from the bottom of the deep all right the Maya they knew this was the oldest land Mayak right we got Agassiz right Louis Agassiz who told us this is the first land out of the primordial waters all right now the Maya they call their country Mayak that is the land first emerged from the bottom of the deep and we read in genesis right let there be land let the water subside let the land show and there was land the first land america the country of the shoe and the egyptians according to herodotus boosted that their ancestors in the lands of the west all right were the oldest men on earth all right quote herodotus go research that he's telling you that the egyptians their ancestors in the lands of the west so if you're in africa america's to the west were the oldest men on earth if the opinion of leo humphrey and a host of modern geologists regarding the priority of america's antiquity be correct all right so i didn't even know about this guy leo humphrey study him all right a known geologist in that time be correct what right have we to gainsay the assertion of the mayas and of the egyptians in claiming likewise priority for their people and their country all right so the mayas are telling you they are from the oldest land all right and the egyptians are telling you that their ancestors come from the west which is the oldest man on earth which will be the oldest land, right? And so what are the, some of the things that we're going to learn? Heard all of that.
and I know that's a lot this is a lot of information to process it's a lot of information to process you can come back and watch this video or watch go to uh, Curry Mio channel and watch some of his videos to try to absorb some of this information because I know it's a lot it's a lot and then me piling my uh, discussion on top of it it could be a lot to absorb all right so I want to really go into matriarch because I wanted to prove to you which culture was the oldest which system was the older matriarch or patriarch and so I'm gonna show you just through research because you hear me talking but I want to come through come here with you and say so you can see it for yourself and you know that I'm not just making it up. I wanted to take you on this research journey with me. So here we are on this journey. So let's just look at matriarchy. It said this is the social system in which females hold the primary power position in roles of political leadership, moral authority, social, pri social privilege, and control over property at the specific exclusion of males, at least to a large degree. While those definitions apply in general English, definitions specific in disciplines of anthropology and feminism differ in some respects. Most anthropologists hold that there are no known anthropological societies that are ambiguously matriarchal, but some authors believe exceptions may exist or may have. Now you see how they just want to not even claim that history. You know, they don't want to even claim that history. Just like there is there's a no-touch rule on the Aborigines here in America. There's a no-touch rule on talking about that matriarch indigenous culture before patriarch even began to uh, come into existence. Okay, and it says here, matriarchs may also be confused with matrineal, matrilocal, matrifocal societies. A few people consider any non-patriarchal system to be matriarchal. Here we go. Thus, including gender narrowly equalitarian systems, but most academics exclude them from matriarchs, matriarchs strictly defined. Okay, so they don't want to call it that. They want to call it matrineal. We're going to go into that too a little, a little bit later. Okay, and it says in the 19th century Western scholarships. The hypotheses of matriarchy represent an early, mainly prehistoric stage of human development gained popularity. Possibilities of so-called primitive societies were cited and the hypotheses survived into the 20th century, including the context of the second wave of feminism. But we're not talking about feminism here. We're just talking about history here, okay? This hypothesis was criticized by some authors such as Cynthia Eller in the myth of matriarchal pre prehistory and remains as largely unsolved question to this day. Some older myths describe matriarchies. All right, so let's go in and look at matrineal because this is a very in interesting definition because they don't want to call it matriarchy. They rather call it matrineal. I guess that's giving it too much power. It's showing too much organization. So they don't want to call it that. That's fine too. But it's still based on the woman being the earth, the woman being the head of household. So let's look at it. Matronality is tracing a kinship through the female line. It may also correlate with the social system in which each person is identified with their matri line, their mother's lineage, and which can involve inheritance of property and or titles. Matri line is a line of decent descent from a female ancestor to the descent in which the individuals in all interviewing intervening generations are mothers, in other words, a mother line. A matrineal descent system, an individual is considered to belong to the same descent group as their mother. The matrineal descent pattern is in contrast to the more common pattern of patrineal descent from which a family name is usually derived. The matrineal of historical nobility, historical, you hear that? Matriline of historical nobility was also called anatic. Or uterine. That's about the Umfe. Remember, I talked about the Umfe and the, and the pyramid mounds, the mounds. 
being you know being first built by this matriarch culture and then later came the pyramids okay corresponded to the patronal which is called the agnatic ancestry okay and what's interesting here is when we go into this matri uh neo society in some traditional societies and cultures memberships in their groups was in the following list still is if shown in italics inherited matrilineally you see the cherokee right here choctaw look at that and that looks like a woman in here you got choctaw you got Giscan, you got the hadia the hopi the Arakos, the Lenape, Navajo, Tengit, in North America, the Kuna people, the Kagi people, the Caribs of South America, the Manakapa people, West Sumatra, Indonesia, Negri, Malaysia. Look at all these, look at all these metronel countries cultures seem to be on every continent and this was very interesting and and most and most in the jewish commu communities and most in the jewish communities and most in the jewish communities are you seeing this okay i had to i had to show you that it says in the 19th century our most prehistorians and anthropologists believed the following Lewis H. Morgan's influential book, Ancient Society, that early human kinship was everywhere, matronial. Are you seeing this? Okay, so I'm not making this up. So those indigenous culture were matronial. All right? This idea was taken from Frederick Ingalls, The Origin of Family, Private, Property, and States. All right, we probably need to go check this out. Check this book out. All right? The Morgan Ingalls thesis that humanity's earliest domestic institution was not the family, but the matronial clan. But the matronial clan soon became incorporated in the communist orthodoxy. In reaction, most 20th century social anthropologists considered the theory, the theory of matronial priority unattainable. They didn't want to look at it. All right? They did not want to look at it right although during the 1970s and 80s a range of feminist scholars often attempted to revive it so it's going to come back like i said this stuff is going to come back all right i want to look at this in recent years evolutionary biologists geneticists paleo paleoanthropologists have been reassessing the issue many citing genetic and other evidence that early kinship may have been matrilineal after all one crucial piece of indirect evidence has been genetic data suggesting that over a thousand of years women among sub-saharan african hunter gatherers hunter gatherers remember i told you these hunter gatherer gatherers practice this have chosen to reside post primarily martially not with their husband's family but with their own mothers and other natal kin all right you're seeing it right here you people so i'm not making it up okay so let's go look at the patriarch society i broke that down for you so you can see how old matriarch culture really is for yourself you know i'm not making this stuff up you know let's look at patriarchy because when you look at patriarchy it's not really that old the, the guess that you know the estimation on it so let's look at patriarchy and how it is defined it is a social system in which men hold primary power and predominant in roles of political leadership moral authority social privilege and control of property some patriarchal societies are patronial meaning that the property and the title are inherited by the male lineage patriarchy is associated with a set of ideas Patriarchy is associated with a set of ideas of patriarchy ideology that acts to explain and justify this dominance. That acts to explain and justify this dominance. That acts to explain and justify this dominance and attributes it to inherent natural differences between men and women. 
You see that 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 narcissistic thinking? You're gonna try to justify why you should dominate, you know, women. Sociologists tend to see patriarchy as a social product and not an outcome of initial differences between the sexes, and they focus attention on the way the gender roles in society affect the power different differentials between men and women. Historically, patriarchy has manifested itself in a social, legal, political, religious, and economic organization of a range of different cultures, even if not explicitly, explicitly defined to be by their own constitution and laws. Most contemporary societies are in practice patriarchal. You see that? Now let's go down into the history of Let's look at, you know, let's look at prehistory. Anthropological, archaeological, evolutionary, psychological evidence suggests that prehistoric societies were, were relatively egalitarian. Okay, so that, again, we're talking about that, that equal, equalitarian, where everybody had equal power, equal rights. That was the matriarch culture. Like I said, when the matriarch culture was in effect, humanity was at its golden stage. It was at its golden stage. And that patriarchal social structures did not develop until many years after the end of the Pleistocene era. What's the Pleistocene era? You're not going to see any kings or anything like that in this area 22 million years ago. You know, that's what they're saying. From 2,588, you know, whatever, to 11,700 years. You're seeing it right here. Okay, so what, 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 what was in existence then? Matriarch, the matronial. Okay, you're seeing it here. They're calling it something else to not talk about the matronial. It's something they're going out of their way to not say matronial under this patriarchy thing. I thought that was that was something too. Following social and technological developments such as agriculture and domestication. See, again, but you can tie this to the ancestral mother because the agriculture belonged to the women. The women was hunter-gatherers. They the one created the food. They had the connection with land. Here we go again. According to Robert Strozer, historical research has not yet found a specific initiated event. Gerda Lerner asserts that there was no single event and documents that patriarchy as social system arose in different parts of the world in different times. So, you know, you know, it, it seems to just, you know, and documents that patriarchy, there is no, no single event and documents of social system that arose in different, and it seemed to just happen at one time. That's basically what they're saying here. This seemed to just happen at one time. You know, like I said, I question those moors. I question those moors. You know, we talked about this Achan breaking away from their mother. We talked about the Achan writing the Bible for, you know, uh, for the Christians. You know, they seem to spring out up, up, up around the same time. And then at the same time, these Aborigine uh, royal women were being kidnapped. Some scholars point out point to about 6,000 years ago when the concept of fatherhood took root as the beginning of the spread of patriarchy. You're seeing it there. Okay, so again, I'm not making this stuff up. Not making it up. Now, you know, you heard me talk about the Amazon and how the uh, meaning of Amazon was very interesting. So let's look, type in the meaning of Amazon because you're right here with me. Uh, you can see the Amazon the meaning. You're gonna type, you're gonna tap on that, and let's look at the Amazon meaning because the meaning is very interesting. You know, this is very, very interesting. And again, it points to a major art culture. Just looking at the definition of it, I had to show you this. Uh, Amazon, a member of a race of female warriors of Greek mythology, because the Greeks talked about them all the time because they occupied a land over there and uh, over there near the Greeks. And, and I'm gonna show you how they were able to get over there because when we look at uh, Queen Califia, we see that she sailed the whole, the, the entire world. So quite naturally, the 
uh, ancient mother armies were placed everywhere, all right, all around the world. The second meaning, a tall, strong, often masculine woman. Third meaning, any of the genius Amazona of tropical America, Paris, typically having green plumage marked with with other bright colors. That kind of reminds me of the Carnival when we dress when they dress up in those colors. You know, kind of reminds me of that. What are we celebrating? It are we celebrating the ancient mother? Mother, uh, you know, is that some kind of festive festive uh, festive towards her? You know. Now let's look at the Amazon, a geographical name. Let's just look at where it's located at. And then we talked about South America, uh, America being the home of indigenous, uh, the ancient indigenous people, and how it was the, could possibly be the home of the ancient mother. And this evidence points to that. Look at this. Amazon, a river 4,000 miles, six. Uh, 6,000, 4,000 miles along in the northern South America, flowing from the Peruvian Andes into the Atlantic in northern Brazil. In northern Brazil. Okay? So why, what, where did they get this name Amazon? Where did this name even come from? It had to come because the, the main meaning of Amazon represents a war, these, Greek, uh, these warriors. These Aborigine, you know, Amazon women. So where did they, who was the Amazon named after? All right, we, you know, it's these questions are worth asking ourselves. So this is very interesting that it's near, it's near the, you know, it's near South America. Northern South America. You see what I'm saying? Okay, so. Did the ancient mothers were they stationed there in that in that location? Did they were that's where they were stationed? They were located in this area. Is this why they named the Amazon? All right, this is you know these questions we should be asking ourselves. I, I can't wait to find information on that. I mean, I don't know where to look, but I'm going to keep looking until I can find more information on that. Okay, so let's go out of here. Uh, I wanted to look up Queen Califia. Yeah, I want to look up Queen Califia. So you can see just how plausible this is, and you connect your own dots on this. Now you're seeing like look at these feathers because I showed you you know some of this stuff because I want to show you this stuff I want to show you these feathers because I want you to look at it one more time here it's kind of taking a while to come up we'll look at it in a minute but let's read a little bit more about Queen Khalifa okay Queen Khalifa was a powerful general queen a strategic opponent who commanded and maintained a fleet of ships while urchin in a time of peace in all surrounding lands. The robust California blacks were master trainers and lovers of exotic animals with developed skills. They were able to teach themselves to defend, utilizing a real force of domesticated trained griffins, eagles, snakes, tigers, and bears, along with other species native to California and Africa. Along with other species native to California and Africa, these unusual creatures were trying to protect the land of its people. So loved and respected and powerful was queen, the queen, she could project her imperial will over the seas of the Mediterranean, a master of communication and commerce, trading gold-tipped spears, gold, diamonds, precious stones, furs, food, plants, 
rare birds and animals, as well as maintaining cultural and trading contacts with Africa, Australia, and Pacific Islands. This great lady ruler also successfully defended her empire during wars in the Mediterranean Sea and Antiolia, as well as against the Byzantine Empire in Southern Europe. So, you know, again, the Greeks talked about them. The Greeks talked about them. Queen Califia and the mighty empire of California Blacks, a people whose civilization and history has been lost to time and space through deliberate destructive conspiracy of lies, secrets, deaths, perpetuated by evil invaders of ancient America. I think it hasn't come up yet. Okay, so let's look at this feather. Look at these women. You know, I want you to take a close look at that because they're found by themselves in these pictures. You know, when they come over here, you know, this is the emblem of America. This is the original and emblem of America. Okay, let's look at some more. You know, because they're, they're, they are, this can't be a coincidence. I want you to look at these one more time. Take a look at these pictures one more time before I get ready to close out. Uh, what else I wanted to look at? I wanted to talk about the Empress of Washita. I thought the, the the story of her uh, family history was just, it, it was so interesting because you have these French men and these Spanish men coming in marrying some of the Aborigine women, and now they're calling themselves Creole. Okay, and it's kind of what happened here with uh, her ancestors. And the story goes that she married Marcus. She married Marcus, you know, to save her land because the French wasn't recognizing them as a people, you know, so or, or civilized. And so to do that. Uh, she wanted the Catholic because the Catholics did not recognize them because you know the Catholic Church is perpetuating all of this war as well. They're, they're wielding their power through politics but don't get it twisted. The Catholics are wielding this, this power you know and so you, you can do your research on that. It was a show I was watching on that I can't even remember the name of the show, but it, it, the show was based on the Catholic Church, and it was showing them how they were taking over uh, different lands through politics. They were sending these politicians out to conquer these different lands or whatever. So the Pope was not going to recognize them as a civilized nation. And so what she did is marry uh, Marcus. And even when she married Marcus, the Pope was just like, no, we're still not going to recognize her as a civilized nation. And so Marcus was left with the land. She did this to protect her land. And so there were, you know, I'm, I'm sure there was a couple of marriages like that. You see that with tribes too. Some of them intermarried uh, to prevent things like this. They would share land and they would marry. And so this was customary, uh, a custom of our two as indigenous people. And so it says Henry T Turner is the child of Marquis de Mason Road by Emperor Washerwoman, Her Highness Saint El Maria. Okay, and uh, Alia Maria, we're gonna see that name again because our ancestors here in America say they descended from the Amira people. And Myra means the word of God as well. All right, so look at that name. It's real. That's very important. The discovery of her Egyptian like coffin is recounted in the return of ancient ones. After Marcus' death, Henry Turner began recovering the titles to all the land and rights and granted under his father's name. So he put it under his name because he wanted to be too, I guess he wanted to protect it of being a civilized nation. But see, this was her mistake for doing that. You know, 
you know, maybe it was a good thing too if they was able to get it back, but it's still not the same. All right, including the Mason Road Grant, the D Bastrop Grant, and the Crossat Grant. All right, and these are the Washita, uh, the Tunica uh, Indians. They call themselves the Dugamania. Okay, all right, and uh, you know. Uh, I firmly believe that's what a lot of that Creole thing was about when they came over here marrying some of these women, these indigenous women, and they were getting a hold to this land. They did. There was some intermarrying going on too, because a lot of these women owned the land. Okay, this is a hunter-gatherers nation, a matronial nation. So the women, they were in charge of the land. Like I said, the woman here and the Moors will tell you that too. The woman is the lawmaker, always has been. The woman is the lawmaker. The man is the law enforcer. Okay? The man is the law enforcer. Like I said, the woman lays down the law and the man enforces the law. Uh, I'm getting ready to close out here. I wanted to talk about these six cultures, the last matriarch civilizations that exist today now in the world. Uh, let me go back here so you can see where I got this stuff. I want you to be able to see uh, what's going on here. Let me get out of here and then go back. Okay, I simply typed in matriarchy because I want to go back to matriarchy. I want you to look at these societies. I'm closing on this note because I'm getting ready to drop another video right after this one. And in the next video, I'm going to talk in depth about these uh, Amazon uh, warriors, women, or this Amazon society. Because all of this is connected. Uh, no one is connecting the dots. You know, uh, like I said, the ancestors is leading me on this journey. Uh, we're going to talk about the six modern societies where women rule. I'm going to click on that. I'm going to talk about this for a little minute, and I'm going to close out. And like I said, my videos are geared at the history of ancient Aborigine indigenous women, that matronial, matriarch culture that was stamped out. Uh, the Amazon video is, is really, when I get into that army, talking about that Amazon army, this next video, I'm going to go more into depth about that army and how far it stretched and to talk about the conflicts they had in the surrounding areas where they were settled. But for right now, I'm going to jump into this. Uh, and, you know, and we looked at the definition of matriarchy. Some of these cultures were listed in there. All right, one of the cultures is the Mosio culture, living at the border of Tibet and Yunnan, Sikwan provinces, the Musio are perhaps the most famous matronial society. The Chinese government officially clarifies them as of another ethnicity, my ethnic minority known as Nazi, but the two are distinct in both culture and language. The Musio live with extended family and large households at the head of each is a matriarch. Lineage is traced through the female side of the family and property is passed down along the same matri line. Musio women typically handle business decisions, men handle politics. Children are raised in the mother's household. The Musio have what's called a walk-in marriage. There is no institution of marriage where the women choose their partners by literally walking to, man, to the man's home and the couple never live together since the children always remain with the mother's care. Sometimes the father plays a little role in the upbringing. In some cases, the father's identity is not, not even known. Instead, the male's child rearing responsibilities remain in his own, in his own matronial household. I guess that's where we get to say it. Mama's baby, daddy's maybe. I guess that's where that sign, where that, that uh, that comes from. Okay, and then we saw in matriarchy. You can go back and look up matriarchy because you're going to see those names listed under prehistory or matronial. It's going to be under matronial. 
the Minek Gup Gubo. Trying to pronounce it, Manakaba, and four million people. The Manakaba of Sumatra, Indonesia, are the largest known matrimonial society today. In addition to travel law, requiring all clan property to be held and bequeathed from mother to daughter, the Magakaba firmly believe the mother to be is the most important person in society. The Manakaba society. Women usually rule the domestic realm while men take the political and spiritual leadership roles. However, both genders feel the separation of powers keep them on an equal footing. Upon marriage, every woman acquires her own sleeping quarters. The husband may sleep with her, but must leave early in the morning to have breakfast at his mother's home. At the age of 10, boys leave their mother's home to stay in men's quarters and learn practical skills and religious teachings while the clan chief is always male women select women select the chief and can remove him women select the chief and can remove him from office should they feel he failed to fulfill his duties remember we talked about the akn the a friend people remember they broke away from their their uh divine mother afram that's what the jews call themselves now that's what the jews mean you know uh they broke away because they call themselves Ephraim now. And Ephraim means break away. All right? And they come from the Akan, the Akan people in Africa. It's where the Jews originated from. I don't know how they turn uh, white now. Maybe they are a converted uh, Jews. I don't know. But yeah, that's what Ephraim means. The Akan people are a majority in Ghana, where they predominantly reside. The Akan social organization is fundamentally built around the Matri clan. See, this proves my point. Matri clan, where in one identities, inheritance, wealth, and politics are all determined. All Matri clan founders are female, but men traditionally hold leadership positions within the society. These inherited roles, however, are passed down matrilineally, meaning through a man's mother and sisters and their children. Other often the man is expected to not only support his own family but those of his female relatives all right going down to the fourth these are modern matriarch society matrilineal societies that exist today the briefly are a small indigenous group of just over 13,000 people living on a reserve in tamanaco can canton in the Lemon province of Costa Rica. Like many other matrimonial societies, the Bri Bri are organized in clans. Each clan is made up of extended family and the clan is determined through the mother females. Women are the only ones who traditionally can inherit land. Women are also endowed with the right to prep the caca use in sacred Bri Bri rituals. We're gonna go to the Garo, much like the Kasi neighbors in Northeast Indian state of Mahagala, Mikala, the Tabito, Burman speaking Garas, has property political succession from mother to daughter. Typically, the youngest daughter inherits her mother's property. Much like the Akan, however, the society is matrilineal, but not matriarchal. See, they don't want to say matriarchal, okay? men govern the society and manage property. Oftentimes, the youngest daughter marriage is arranged for her, but non-inheriting daughters. The process can be much more complex in Garo tradition. The groom-to-be is expected to run away from the proposal of marriage, requiring the bride to be family to capture him and return him to his potential bride village. I thought that was funny. I'm going to go on down. And the last one is Navagasi. Navagasi is in South Bougainville, an island west of New Guinea. Anthropologist Jill Nash reported Navagasi society was divided into two matrilineal societies, which are then divided into matriarchs. Navagasi women are involved in leadership ceremonies, but the most pride in working the land entitled to them. Nash observed the women it comes 
Nash observed that when it comes to marriage, the Navagasi women held gardening, shared sexuality, equal importance. Marriage is not an institutionalized. If a couple is seen together, sleeps together, the man is assists the woman in her garden for all intents and purposes they are considered married so you see that hunter gathers tradition right there that concludes this video i thank you so much for being here with me during here during this video uh if you like what you heard you know let me know that if you got any comments any objections or anything like that i want to know about that too you know but I look forward to seeing you in my next video. I'm going to talk more about the Amazon warriors, the Amazon army, okay? Light and love, my ancestors be with you.